Hi, um, everyone. I can already see a lot of people joining this session. So let me begin. We have about an hour for this conversation. I'm truly delighted to introduce the stellar panel of critical scholars on the course curation workshop as a part of the panel discussions organized by the INET education platform in the YSI early career days. Uh, we could not think of you know, a more suited set of academics to begin today's session with. Not only have these scholars made fundamental contributions to economic thinking, they've also been committed to the process of teaching and institution building for decades now. Particularly at a time when academia has become a space of intense publishing competition, or as a senior professor from University of Calcutta would say, production of papers by the means of papers. There is a rather urgent need to rethink seriously and critically about teaching both as a political and an intellectual endeavor. It is in that context that we are engaging in a conversation with Professor Jayati Ghosh and Professor David Ruccio uh, today to speak to them about the course curation process. And personally, I'm very delighted to have two scholars who I really look up to and whose works I've followed uh, to speak with me today on this process. By way of brief introductions for people who do not need an introduction, let me begin by saying that um, Professor Jayati Ghost is a professor of, uh, in economics at University of Massachusetts Amherst and has taught economics at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi for nearly 35 years. She has received several awards, including the, uh, for distinguished contributions to the social sciences in India, the International Labour Organization's Decent Work Research Prize, and the Nordsud uh, Prize for Social Sciences. She has authored several journal articles and authored or edited several books, some of which include Never Done and Poorly Paid, Women's Work in Globalizing India, co-edited uh, Elga Handbook of Alternative Theories of Economic Development, Demonetization, Decoded, and Women Workers in Informal Economy. She has advised government in India and in several other countries and has consulted for international organizations and member of several international commissions. She is the Executive Secretary of International Development Economics Associates and an international network of hetero, which is an international network of heterodox development economists. She writes regularly for newspapers, journals, and blogs. Thank you very much for joining us. And today, Professor Ghosh will discuss her process of curating a course on international economics. Um, professor David Ruccio is a professor emeritus at the University of Notre Dame, where he was a professor of economics from 1982 to 2019. He was also a member of the Higgins Labor Studies Program and the John B. Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. He's won the Carnap Teaching Award, the Reverend Edmund P. Joyce CSC Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching, and an American Association of University Professors Academic Freedom Award. Professor Ruccio's main research areas are Marxian economic theory, inequality and the Second Great Depression, international political economy, economic development, particularly Latin America, and economic methodology. He has engaged and published widely on this topic. His books, some of his books include Development and Globalization, a Marxian class analysis, economic representations, both academic and everyday, Postmodern Moments in Modern Economics, Postmodernism, Economics and Knowledge, and Postmodern Materialism in Future of Marxist Theory. Professor Ruccio is also a founding member of the journal Rethinking Marxism and has served as its editor for 12 years. He's currently working on three new book manuscripts, including Critique and Utopia, Mind the Gap, and What's the Matter with Exploitation. His blog is Occasional Links and Commentary on Economics, Culture, and Society, which, by the way, I use uh, draw upon heavily from for my own teaching. And he frequently writes for the Real World Economics uh, Review blog. Uh, today, he will be discussing his uh, process of curating a course on political economy and some of his uh, course syllabi, which will, uh, are already on the INET education platform. And I'll share the links in the chat right away. The structure of the discussion is as follows. We will have about 35 to 40 minutes of structured discussion, followed by about 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A from the attendees. So let's begin. Um, let me start with my first question to Professor Jayati Ghosh and ask her if she could take us through what might be some key elements that she would include in a course on international economics. <laughs> What would be the narrative of such a course? How would she structure it? And what might be some key texts or scholars that she would include in the course? 
Thank you much, so much, Surabhi. And you know, I'm so delighted to be with you again in YSI. I think it's a terrific job you're all doing. And I really am proud to be even partly associated with all of your efforts. So, you know, I've been teaching this course on international economics, I think now 15, 20 years. And it's a course, remember, that was designed for Indian students. So it is fundamentally really about international trade finance and development. It's not really about uh, broadly international economics in the way that is conceived, because a lot of that is not necessarily immediately relevant for developing student, country students. But I, the way I've tried to do it, and remember that this was a course in an MA program, so students have done undergraduate, but I have a feeling you could possibly do the same thing even for an undergraduate course. I have divide, I divided it into two parts, one to do with international trade and one to do with international finance. And it begins really by looking at the theories of trade, then goes on to the institutions, the evolution, if you like, of trade patterns and the institutions that have governed trade. And then finally, the trade policies that are relevant for developing countries. But when I'm looking at theories with the trade half, you begin with the basic question, well, why do countries trade at all? What determines the patterns of trade? What are the gains and losses from trade? And what are the implications of trade, the other implications? And this, I look at all kinds of theories over time, beginning with the other canon, if you like, uh, that uh, Eric Reinert and others have talked about, the early Italian theorists of trade and others and how they actually incorporated increasing returns to trade, in, in trade. And then how Ricardo, uh, well, basically Smith in, doesn't really exclude it either, but then it disappears in Ricardo. And then I talk about the Heckscher, Rollin, Samuelson, Linder's demand similarity, the imperfect competition models and so on. But in each one of these, the focus is on what are the assumptions? How important are these assumptions? What happens when you drop one or the other? And that's absolutely critical. So you realize that, you know, Ricardo's theory is actually a theory based on technology differences. And he's assuming all kinds of other things. The heckscher rollin theory is a theory based entirely on so-called endowment differences and on differences in factor intensity of production. But these are not the only assumptions they're making. They're also assuming perfect competition. They're also assuming full employment. What happens when you drop those? The theory collapses and so on. So basically you, you try and look at each of the theories to see what are the underlying assumptions, which are the critical ones that would change how that theory works or does it. And then how relevant are those assumptions and therefore how relevant is that to the real world? So you quickly see that, you know, the Heckscher and Samuelson model is not relevant, right? Because there's no imperfect competition for heaven's sake. There's no economies of scale. So, you know, all of the things that matter in today's world don't exist. And in fact, mattered even when they and so on. So you, you move, you do the progression in terms of the theories. Then you look at how trade has evolved. And I, again, begin pretty early. I, I begin way back in, in terms of, you know, the... Uh, the 16th century onwards, and the fact that so much of trade came, you know, uh, uh, with the barrel of the gun. In other words, it wasn't simply free trade. It was trade that was created by military uh, expansions and what implications that had. And so how much of the colonial trade patterns then influenced the subsequent trade patterns and ended up in a global division of labor that we saw in the 19th century. Then how come, then, if, then over time, what are the other kinds of institutions that created the architecture of that trade, culminating, of course, in the WTO? You know, the successive gaps were relatively minor, but then the Uruguay round really cemented a certain architecture, what implications that has. And then all of this then leads to a discussion of, okay, what are the trade policies for developing countries? And remember, the focus here is only about development, but what are the possibilities? What could you have done before that you can't do now? What are you still able to do? What happens if you can't do something? What implications does it have for domestic division of labor, domestic patterns of production, domestic employment, and so on and so forth? And uh, if we have time, not always, we get into some of the current, very contemporary things, you know, like 
say, you know, the US-China trade technology dispute, something like that would enter. The second half of the course is the same structure, but now for finance. So the second half of the course is looking first at, I suppose, what is broadly called open economy macro, right? I mean, theories of balance of payment adjustment, exchange rate determination, the implications of exchange rates, Mundell Fleming type models, and etc., and theories of um, capital flow. And again, the same idea, look at the assumptions. Where are they valid? Where are they not valid? What happens? Which are the critical assumptions? If you drop it, what changes? And so on. And the idea is always to make the students keep questioning that throughout the process. Then again, the whole evolution of in the international economic order, if you like, beginning from pre-colonial trade, I mean, financing of movements to the colonial kinds of finance, to the post-colonial finance, the Bretton Woods institutions and what they did in terms of creating a global structure. I've taken too long, I'm sorry, I will hurry up. And um, then finally, uh, you know, the current post-Bretton Woods, if you like, kinds of scenario. And once again, then, then what are the policy options for developing countries? How do you deal with capital flows? What do you do when, you know, what's the implication of financial liberalization, especially capital account integration? How do you, you know, do a kind of control of that in order to and yet access finance and so on? So th those are the kinds of things that I try and cover. Thank you very much for that response. This is, uh, I mean, I understand like to uh, respond to something like this in the little time that we have is very difficult, but you've covered like a very, uh, you know, broad ground, I think, which has set like a very interesting stage for the conversation that we'll have. Uh, if I may go to Professor Ruchu as well and request him to also take us through some key elements uh, of the political economy course, the narrative, the structure and the key texts. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm going to try to keep my answer short so there's more time for question and answer. I, I presume uh, viewers, participants um, will want to engage both of us. I just want to say I, I want to take Jayati's course. Um, I wish I'd had that many years ago, but I've retired now, so I won't. Um, I have I have taught, uh, I taught, uh, I'm now emeritus professor uh, during the almost four decades I, I taught at the University of Notre Dame. I taught political economy in every course I ever offered, um, from principles of microeconomics through upper level graduate courses. Um, so scores of courses, hundreds of times offered uh, over, as I say, almost four decades as a professor. Um, I always found a way to teach political economy. But I also taught three specialized courses. Um, one at what, in, at least in the United States, we would call the intermediate undergraduate level. So after they've taken principles of economics, um, one of the more advanced uh, undergraduate levels. So basically for graduating seniors and then a graduate course. Um, and in all honesty, uh, they were all basically the same um, for for intermediate undergraduates, uh, advanced undergraduates, graduate students. Um, the only difference was that they had different texts and different assignments. Um, but I basically approached uh, the topic in the same way. Um, but I have to start with a definition. Um, I, I, I apologize in advance. There's no such thing as political economy. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Sue. Um, better, let me, let, me, let, me, let me change that a little bit. It, it's a catch-all category for a variety of different theories and approaches. Um, so there is no thing called political economy, no one way of doing or thinking about political economy. Um, so it's, it's a variety of approaches. Uh, and the way I approached it is that it's a variety of critiques of and alternatives to mainstream economics. So what I'm calling political economy is sometimes called non-mainstream economics, a term I hate, uh, or sometimes heterodox economics or whatever it is. So there's the mainstream out there and then there are the rest of us. Um, and, and this is an introduction to what the rest of us do. Um, so there's three key aspects to every put specialized political economy course I ever taught. Um, one is that it's a critique of mainstream economics. 
both micro and macro, both neoclassical and Keynesian. And I, I understand my post-Keynesian friends used to get upset, but I but Keynesian macroeconomics for me is part of mainstream economics um, and has been not quite from the beginning, but soon thereafter. So it's one, a critique of mainstream economics. Two, it's a an exposure to diverse approaches to that critique. So, for example, Marx and modern classical economics, basically Schwabian economics, post-Keynesian economics, radical economics, institutional economics, feminist economics, post-colonial economics, and what we might call ecology or green economics. Little footnote here. I used to include the Austrians in these non-mainstream or political economy approaches, but I kicked them out a long time ago once they became uh, part of the mainstream again. Um, so, so what students get then is a sense that, boy, there are lots of different ways of doing political economy. There are lots of ways of doing economics other than mainstream economics. And later on, we'll talk about what that meant for the students. And in the end, so one, the critique, to the alternative, and three at the end, specific topics. So to show why such criticisms mattered. So we would discuss economic justice and the economics of households, economic crises, alternatives to capitalism, climate change, and so on. Now, like Jayoti, we always ran out of time towards the end, but, but I would always select at least four or five specific topics. So when the students say, oh, why do all these theoretical debates matter? I could then point them to topics and engage the debate. Well, here, when we discuss economic justice, here's a neoclassical definition of economic justice. And here, for example, is a Marxian definition of economic justice. And look how they differ, not only theoretically in terms of their assumptions, but also when it comes to real world policies and strategies and policies. What, that's where it matters, the consequences of these approaches. So it really does matter which theory you're using. It's not just an academic debate. It's a debate that matters for policy and for people's lives, right? So, so you have posted, I see in, 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 the, in the conversations, some of my syllabi. So there's an example of a, a, a introduction to public economy for undergraduates a topics in political economy course uh, for advanced undergraduates, and then my graduate political economy course. As for texts, for me, they all depend. Just as Jayati explained, she taught an international economics course in India. And, and that mattered in, not only in India, but as a master's level course, right? So you would change the topics and change the, the texts. So for me, it depends on the level of the course where one is teaching, not only which country one is teaching in, but what kind of university one is teaching in, whether in the United States, it'd be a community college or an advanced research institution. Um, you know, over the course of four decades of teaching, I got to know my students, not the particular ones, but, but their background, what they came in with. And so I would write a syllabus that, that both um, uh, involved an understanding of what they had already had in economics, but also the kinds of views and opinions they brought into the classroom, and I would choose my texts accordingly. So I, I don't have any particular texts that I would offer. For me, every professor has to make that, that decision. Um, and, and in fact, one of the most important things we do is we write a syllabus. That syllabus is a, is a curation. It is a, is a map, if you will, of knowledge. And therefore, I, you know, I, I have some colleagues who don't take it very seriously. I always did because, you know, that, that's what students were either going to read during the course of the of the semester, or if, if they didn't read it, at least they had a sense of, of, of what that mapping of the world looked like. So my own preference was to stay away from textbooks and have students read actual articles and books. So, so I'd have them read some of the classics. I'd have them read Marx and Veblen and Schraffa and Polanyi and so on. In fact, being a, a bit of a brat, um, I would tell my students to take those books into their other economics classes um, and ask the professors if they actually read the books, which, of course, they never had. Uh, these are my mainstream colleagues. And then I would add some contemporary texts. So, for example, in that advanced political economy course I taught, um, I'd have them read. Um, I'd actually start with, with Smith's Wealth of Nations, 
um, and then have them read Marx and Devlin and Polanyi. And then I'd twin them with contemporary texts so that they they got some history of economic thought, but 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 it, they didn't look at it in an antiquarian way, if you will. So it was contemporary. So I had them read um, uh, Piketty's book and and then Paris on on the uh, guaranteed basic income and David Graeber and Resnick and Wolf and David Harvey and so on and so forth. Um, so that they would see that these debates are alive and, and kicking, if you will, in, in, in the contemporary world. Um, and then, like all good syllabi, I'd spring some surprises. Um, so my favorite one, uh, at least for U.S. students, was Einstein. Uh, yes, I would remind the students that Einstein, the one they thought was the most brilliant thinker of all time. Um, and he wrote uh, an article in the first issue of Monthly Review in 1948 um, advocating socialism. So the, the person that the students thought was the smartest person who ever lived um, was in favor of socialism. And that was always a nice way to end that course. Thank you, Professor Ruccio. Um, very excited to take the course. I, of course, took the political economy course with your student, which was, of course, a very exciting one as well. But uh, thank you. This is very, very exciting to get started. If I may just follow up uh, on uh, something that you raised and ask you another question of uh, the predominantly mainstream departments usually do not offer, of course, such a course. But what has what at least I think seems to be happening is that in many pluralist or heterodox departments, they're increasingly less likely to engage with the theoretical aspects of many of these alternative schools of thought. Say, for example, Marxian theory, they'll study ideas, uh, but not so much as the theoretical aspects of it. What could be the potential implications of it in terms of how we prepare students? Is this for me? Yes. 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 Um, so it gets right to the way I, I, I always taught the course. And um, I focused on theories or what I sometimes call stories or discourses or frameworks of analysis or call them what you will um, in every course I've ever taught. So there's a kind of a implicit epistemology there, that there are diverse theories through which to construct different understandings of capitalism with different consequences. So there's no correct theory, no absolute truth, and there's no single theory of political economy. When people teach political economy as if it were a single theory, that's what they offer, one approach and not the others, whether it be post-Keynesian or Marxian or whatever. Um, Here's what happens when you don't focus on theories. And Jayati was getting at this when, when she talked about her course in international economics. You forget about the assumptions and everything is in the assumptions. Everything is hidden within that technical apparatus. So when our mainstream colleagues teach economics, that's what they teach. They teach the technical apparatus. They don't identify the assumptions. And one of the things that we do as political economists is precisely focus on those assumptions. Oh, you argue that everybody, neoclassical economics, everybody gets what they deserve. So uh, let's see how that works. Not just as an empirical example, but based on the particular assumptions of the theory. Oh, you're assuming certain things about markets and you're assuming certain things about preferences and you're assuming certain things about production such that nothing is left over. Everybody gets what they deserve. And oh, look, capitalism is fair. The whole point of political economy for me is to dethrone that idea, to criticize that idea, not to just saying it's, it's, it's inaccurate or it's not a good representation of the world, but because of its basic assumptions, change the assumptions, yet change the conclusions. And to me, you only get at that discussion by looking at theories. So here's the irony. I taught political economy, as I say, in every course I ever taught. I also ended up teaching a lot of mainstream economics because the students hadn't learned it. Concrete example. So I'm teaching Marxian economics, for example, obviously where surplus value and exploitation are prominent. And I, I would turn to the students and say, so um, what's the theory of profits in neoclassical theory? 
and they would look at me with blank stares like they'd never seen that question. These, these are students who had been through principles of microeconomics, intermediate microeconomics. They'd been through scads of, 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 of applications of microeconomics, and they couldn't answer the simple question. I would turn to them and say, we're talking about capitalism here. Profits are central to capitalism, and you don't know what the theory of profits is in neoclassical theory? Well, and, and so the, the conversation would go on. Well, there are no profits. We mean on a well, they're competed away. So you have a theory of capitalism according to which profits are competed away, whereby there can't be any cap no, so that's a stupid theory. So we my point that would then lead us into a discussion. I would then have to teach them the neoclassical theory of profits, which they never learned in order to understand the critiques of the neoclassical theory of profits, and so on and so forth. And I would do that in neoclassical microeconomics, I would do it in Keynesian macroeconomics. So my students would end up getting a twofer. My students would end up getting a new course in mainstream economics, as well as the political economy critique of an alternative to mainstream economics. So we had, as you can imagine, lots of discussions and debates. And then we tie them to the real world. Then we take up real world examples. Thank you. That's, uh, yeah, I mean, to say the least, very exciting in terms of how to reread re mainstream theory from this critical lens. And I think there's more mainstream courses uh, from that lens that needs to be offered in different uh, you know, universities. Uh, if I may go to uh, Professor Ghosh with something similar in terms of her course on international economics, what would a mainstream version of this course now look like? So kind of just uh, flipping the question and what are the potential implications of that in terms of how we end up training the students? Well, you know, that's, that relates to something David already mentioned, that, you know, it's hard to use textbooks because all there are so many mainstream textbooks in international economics. And, you know, they're all pretty good, if you see what I mean. I mean, there's Krugman and Obstfeld, there's Austin and Reed, there's a whole bunch of things that students go through which are standard and which seem relevant because they're giving you examples, they have little problems, they help you solve, they say, if you're exporting this, then you will need so much of that. You know, they, they make it appear that it's directly applicable. The problem is precisely that they don't clarify that these theories have particular validity for only certain situations, which most of the time don't exist. In other words, they don't make the assumptions very clear. They list some assumptions, but not all or they will tuck it away in such a way that it, you know you don't really absorb the fact that, hey, wait a minute, no increasing returns, but isn't most production now increasing returns other than very few, uh, you know, they all perfect competition really. I mean, they will sort of slide it in quietly without your recognizing that this is fundamental. And this is a problem that, um, that that's the big difference between, you know, let's say the most mainstream economics courses, which are, I would say expressed in these very uh, very well-known textbooks, which is that they don't isolate this critical problem. I mean, all the discussions of, let's say, the heterogeneous theories, quite apart from not mentioning that they assume constant returns to scale and so on, and similar tastes and all of that kind of thing, they also assume full employment, right? So it changes everything. If you are going to have losers from trade, you can't understand Trump's appeal in the US until you realize that there are losers from this thing. And that those losers, it's not just that their wages fall, they don't have jobs. And that means something. Uh, so I think you know, there, is a, there are many ways in which it would differ. I think they're all trying to be relevant now, there's no question, but they don't make it explicit how exactly the theory prevents it from being as relevant as it could be, I would say. Thank you for the response. It, uh, both of your points reminds me of this conversation I had uh, with a friend a few days ago, and we were talking about these new textbooks and different sort of ideas coming where, the, I, where it becomes about, okay, let's, you know, kind of talk about things that exist in the real world. And there's more of a conversation about, okay, let's not take these assumptions that do not matter. But we were also discussing how that becomes 
how that hides the political basis of how these theories are created, right? Like when neoclassical theory starts with perfect competition, it's not simply of now replacing it with imperfect competition, but perfect competition also kind of denotes a particular capitalist utopia that if you do one, two, three, you're expected to achieve. If that assumptions are kind of not made relevant or rather uh, students are introduced to how these assumptions lead to different conclusions, what we're also doing is basically depoliticizing academia, which is, prob which is probably not at all a heterodox economics, I mean, any heterodox academics mandate. Uh, so, so let me kind of flip the question and I'll, I'll go back to Professor Grosh to ask the question about um, the pedagogical tools, uh, if you could uh, talk about some of the pedagogical techniques that you found useful for such a course, such as different teaching methods, different assessment methods. And there's also a question in the chat uh, from Nico uh, Nicolas that I'll uh, uh, relate to it. And uh, he asked that over the years of teaching and uh, based on the experience, have the methods that you've changed, uh, that you use to engage with the student, has it changed, for example, including more virtual tools, et cetera? So I'll go to Professor Ghosh first. Thank you. Yeah, this is a, you know, again, it's very context specific. <coughs> and I think David put his finger on it when he said it really depends on who you're teaching and, and what level and everything. So we get, I mean, in JNU, we used to get students who have done an undergraduate degree but they come from very, very different backgrounds. There are some who have been to the elite colleges, are very fluent in English. There are some who are first generation learners who have really been through not a particularly rigorous, even you know, neoclassical training. And so you really have to cater to a very, very different crowd. And that's quite complicated. So I, pref I mean, it would be ideal if I could give everybody you know, a textbook and then all the different critiques of those theories, but that's asking a lot. That's a very big ask, especially for those who come from less privileged backgrounds. I also want to emphasize, I do believe this very strongly. The job of a teacher is not to teach the best ones. They don't really need us. The job is to get the point across to the weakest people in the class, the ones who really are not getting it, who are, you know, who are, are terrorized or floundering or what, or even disinterested. That's our job. And that means that you have to think about ways of using the textbooks taking bits of them. We would take, for example, a particular textbook and then in a way kind of dissect it in class. And I would try and get people involved in this. I, I used to try, I have to mention this, I think this is very important for young teachers to learn. I, uh, I, I try to be very interactive. So I, if people don't ask questions in class, I sometimes ask them, I say, what do you think of this? Or, you know, do you have this? So, and I thought it was a way of getting all these students involved. And one of these girls came back to me after class and she happened to be from one of the reserved categories, you know, underprivileged, uh, marginalized categories who had uh, gotten. And she said, you have no idea how you terrorize us because we are living in fear that suddenly we'll be called on and it has it's destroyed the classroom experience for me. So you see, there was a deep insensitivity on my part that I hadn't here I was thinking I'm bringing everybody in. Actually, I was terrorizing. So I think we have to be very conscious of the different ways in which you can draw people in and generate interest. There are some who I would say, just meet me after class and I would talk to them in Hindi because they were not comfortable in English. Mm -hmm. And so there are some who I would suggest, okay, don't try to read this textbook. Here are my notes, you know? In other words, really you have to approach it at different levels. And I think, as I said, the good ones, you know, they're gonna be fine. They will pick it up, they will learn it, they, they, they're going to be all right without us. You just have to give them a direction and they will they will be fine. Whereas the ones who uh, are, are weaker really, I think, need that extra impetus. Thank you. Um, that's interesting because I feel like, especially I guess with Zoom, something that happened the last year of the pandemic, a lot of time, a lot of us were excited about teaching. There was no just bumping into teachers or students in corridors where you can ask the con questions as a free flowing conversations and not always as a structured two hour go to the you know book a zoom slot etc. Um, so on that note, I'll, I'll go to Professor Ruccio and ask him about, you know, I saw Gasalabai also has some interesting movies and uh, various link, uh, you know, links to various blogs, etc. If you could uh, tell us a little about your pedagogical practices and how if that has changed over the years as well. 
Sure. Um, and, and and good, because it did change over the years. And and I and I would admit I became more and more old school. Um in, in, in the sense of um, uh, no quizzes, no tests, no PowerPoint, no clickers, none of that crap, um, which stands in for teaching and is not teaching. Um, and, and I'm with Jayati on this. Um, we lecture and we elicit discussion and we use every trick in the book to do so. So, you know, I, I, one of the ways I did it was I, I would explain to the students that the four walls of the classroom were kind of sacred. Um, that they could uh, and should say anything they wanted to within those four walls, and that was fine. Um, but they weren't impermeable. So the discussion that started within those four walls both reflected the world outside those walls and spilled over um, into conversations on the sidewalk and, and in my office hours and so on. So, but the point was of the four walls was this was an intellectual conversation that we are uh, collaborating um, in, 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 in an intellectual kind of um, conversation um, that they were invited into. And there were certain rules for that. And, and one of the rules for that was to do the reading and to think about the reading and to come into the classroom with questions. Um, and so I was inviting them in as participants in that conversation. Um, and the more, you know, I, like Jayati, I used to terrorize the students um, by asking them questions, but, but, but that was the challenge. So the challenge was that they came prepared to do so. Um, and I understand there are all kinds of students with different backgrounds come in um, and, and they're not prepared to do that. And, and I used to explain to them that the shame at the end of the semester was we finally figured out how to have this intellectual collaboration and then they move on and go on to another course. And, and so, um, and that was, that was the only sad thing about teaching. Good question about the movies, um, as you saw in my syllabi. So I would have them read, you know, I'd have them read, think about this, The Wealth of Nations, um, Volume 1 of Capital, The Theory of the Leisure Class, um, and, 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 and The Great Transformation. All right. So that's it. And then, and then four other contemporary books. So that was a pretty, you know, reading heavy semester. And then they'd write papers. That was it. Read, read and write. Um, and then I gave them a break. Um, so I then show films. So, for example, very typically, I would show uh, Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times, uh, Michael Moore's Roger and Me, Charles Ferguson's Inside Job, and Barbara Koppel's Harlan County, USA. Four classic movies, and I would teach them as such. And that was partly as a break from reading these texts, but it was also a lesson of reading political economy in, in forms other than textbooks, articles, and books. In other words, there is lots of political economy out there in the world. There's political economy in movies and in music and in political campaigns and in churches and religions and so on and so forth. So political economy, economics generally, but especially political economy, wasn't just an academic pursuit that we are surrounded. We are saturated by political economy. And so the question then is, how do we read it? So those movie discussions became, how do you read the movie? How do you read the political economy, the critique of capitalism in Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times? Yes, laugh, be entertained, but also think about what's going on here. How does he take us from the factory to, to, to the, the, the shack um, where the poor live? Um, and, and how did the police chase down the riders? What is that political economy there? And now let's imagine um, it, how that's enacted in lots of other, if you will, forms of media. So that's, that's the way I approached it. Um, thank you. So th this also reminds me of, uh, you know, th uh, the work, um, I mean, that you've done and our whole clamor and stuff, because last year I was teaching a course in communicating economics, where right. the idea was just different forms of uh, economics conversation and how do we communicate it. And that became very interesting because we were also watching movies. We were talking about this change in labor regime over the Fordist period and other periods. And the kind of insights that students got while reading graphic novels, while reading movies, was something that I couldn't bring forth even in a political economy class because there were such subtle ways in which these art forms brought it to students, which yeah. was, uh, yeah, so that was heavily Good inspired. <laughs> 
Thank you. Uh, so I'll, I'll actually go to one of the questions in the uh, you know, uh, Q&A box, and I would request uh, the attendees to keep fielding in the question as I direct it uh, to you. It's uh, both of you've been in institutions which have had a very interesting history in terms of how they have kind of uh, posed a resistance to the mainstream. So there's a question uh, from Jay, who's the manager at YSI, who asked, did you ever encounter any institutional resistance to the topics and alternative methods you teach in your course? If so, how did you navigate these situations? Uh, may I first go to uh, Professor Ghosh, and uh, who's, uh, I mean, the entire uh, sort of political battle in JNU, everybody in India, all students in India are aware of. And I guess today is also a very historical day because the farm laws where the student community had also been supporting, uh, you know, the farmers in the country, they've been repealed, which is a big a success, a political success for uh, various struggling classes in the country. So may I first go to Professor Coach to respond to that? Yeah, thank you so much. So, you know, within my department and university, for most of my career, I lucked out. We were uh, given a great deal of freedom in designing our own courses, and I was very lucky to be in a department that had at least half the economists of the heterodox variety that David described about, which meant that we had some freedom, at least in our own courses. Yes, of course, there was pushback. And yes, there was also pushback among students, because let's face it, you know, the financial incentives are very, very different if you choose to do, stay in the mainstream and, and if you choose to stay and get out. They are, the whole thing is designed to push you really into uh, the sort of more mainstream way. and. Um, in fact, sometimes there would be pushback. I didn't get it so much, but I know that people who taught macro would get pushed back saying, you're not teaching the latest stuff in macro, which they said, yes, we are. We're just telling you how it is wrong. And we're telling you how to understand an economy. But you know, there would be this, this kind of pushback. It wasn't institutional in the same way. I think that's a real problem. That became a serious problem in, in my university only very recently because it was seen as a place of that encouraged people to think and therefore to protest. And uh, that that has become a, a major concern in, in a more existential way. That is that they want to wipe you out rather than just prevent you from teaching a particular thing. That's different. Having said that, I want to just link this with a question that I see in your uh, chat box about, uh, the, about how economics education really needs to be taken to the wider public. And which I firmly agree with. I think it's far too important to be left to economists. And I think this links to that. I think we will be successful in pushing back against institutional attempts to force us to, you know, just stick to very limited mainstream kinds of approaches only if we have a wider public support for the economics we do. And we can only get that if we explain to people how uh, it affects them as exactly as David said in every part of their life and how things that they think are far too complicated or too technical to understand or written in stone and laws of economics that have to occur and cannot be changed are ultimately just the result of political choices and that those political choices play out in particular ways. That's a very important job that I think all of us have that we can't just be teachers within the classroom. We have to actually go out there and be whatever you want to call it, public intellectuals. I mean, ideally in the Gramsci sense, but the point is we have to try and take the, the essential things that we're pointing out everywhere. And of course, so much of what we talk about then affects policy. And so much crap gets used to justify policies that it's even more politically important to, uh, to keep pushing to get that wider acceptance, I think. Um, thank you. Uh, just on that note of how to make economics more accessible for everyone, uh, it, there's it, someone's already put it in the chat as I was doing it. Uh, Professor Goch has a really interesting uh, series on feminist economics with the INET, which I think is a fantastic source for anyone to talk about feminist economics and convey it to people, uh, not just who are, uh, you know, seeped in the academic uh, discipline. So uh, I'm just posting the link for that. So I I'll go with the same question to Professor Ruccio as well, if you could talk about the institutional challenges and also uh, maybe reflect on what uh, Professor Ghosh said about how to take economics to the public 
And how strict do you see these boundaries of economics for the public and economics for every day to use that? Good. And you're going to give me another half hour to, to talk about this? Um, <laughs> No, no, though. I mean, what, what you get at is it, you started with the politics and, and here we are with the politics again, because there's the politics of the theories, right? That there are political consequences of these various mainstream and heterodox theories. But there's also the politics of the academy. Um, and by the academy, I mean not only teaching, but also research and research funding and journal publications and so on and so forth. Right. So 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 Jayapi and I are in the same situation, although Perhaps at, at, at Nehru, it was a little bit easier. Um, the mainstream has 99% of, of economics, um, but they want 100%. Um, so they, they don't want just a lot of it. They want it all. So there's always pushback. There's been pushback my entire life uh, from, from uh, you know, as an undergraduate student, a graduate student, as a professor. Um, I was lucky. Um, I got a job. I got a job as a Marxian economist at a time when my department um, prided itself on being eclectic. Um, that department, you alluded to the interesting histories of our institutions, was then um, divided and then taken away. So I was without a job or without at least a department. Um, and I had to do something that I never wanted to do in my life. I had to be entrepreneurial and go to other departments and offer them courses in economics, um, which is what I did. So I found a way of continuing to teach these things. Um, the point is there's always pushback and we always have to find ways. We have to find ways in the courses in which that we're allowed to teach. So I was lucky. I was able to teach standalone courses in political economy, courses in Marxian economics, um, courses in postmodern economics and so on and so forth. Um, but I also found a way in every single one of my courses to teach political economy. And that was principles of microeconomics to 200 students statistics and econometrics, hell, mathematical methods for graduate students. Um, I always found a way of teaching. There's always a way of doing that. But your point again is, so how do we do this within the academy and how do we do it beyond the academy? And, and you mentioned my blog before. One of the reasons I created that blog was to expand the discussion of economic issues. And here's what I said. I've got a PhD in economics. I've been doing this stuff for decades. I can read this stuff. I can read it critically. And in all honesty, a lot of my friends can't or don't want to. So one of the jobs I have is to read economics critically and then to write about it. So I'm, I couldn't be more pleased that you have found it useful for your, your, your own teaching. Um, that's why I created it, to communicate with students, to communicate with people I never even had as students, but I knew were out there, to activists, um, to all those people who have an interest in economics only because they are, it is imposed on them all the time and they want to learn how to think critically about it. Some of that I taught in my classrooms, obviously thousands of students over the years, um, but here was another way of teaching economics, of engaging in that conversation, of engaging in that intellectual collaboration. Uh, and so I've been doing it, I don't know, something 12, 13 years now. Uh, I've been have written millions of words on that blog, all of which are critical readings of economics. So I, I think there are a lot of ways of doing it. That's one way that I found I, I was able to do it. Thank you. Um... I, I guess like one of the questions that relates to this conversation that I would like to put to the panel and uh, is that there's a question in the chat by Sam who asks that, uh, do you feel that it would be helpful for someone to write an alternative textbook or one that highlights all these assumptions through comparative analysis by the way you do? So if there is an existing textbook, or do you think that there should be another one? And there's another question by Alex Hallett, which goes to, again, the point both of you raised is that I'm confused by the argument that mainstream economics doesn't talk about assumption, isn't part of the models to make assumptions explicit. Um, so yeah, the question is for you. Jati? OK, thank you. I'll start. Um, so. Uh, yeah, you know, um, yes, I wish there were a good textbook. And I, for years, I've been thinking I should try and write one myself, which I haven't. I haven't found one that really suits me the way I want. So I do a little bit of what David does. I take bits and pieces from different places. I make them read articles. I make them read some of the classics. 
or I hope they read some of the classics, let me put it that way. And, um, and then we also get into specific research articles sometimes or more contemporary discussions, hoping that all of that links together. I haven't found a textbook that really does this unveiling of the different theoretical approaches and their exact relevance in particular conditions or lack of it in a way that would suit me. So I end up not relying on, I mean, there, in fact, students are always very confused because they assume that there will be a textbook for the course. And I said, no, there's no textbook. You are free to use any of the following. You can come and discuss with me. We will use bits of them in class to comment on them rather than necessarily to, and this is not something that students are used to. They're used to knowing that there is, you know, there's a certain body of knowledge and they have to absorb it rather than that they have to think of, think it through critically. So it's a whole new and different way of learning, I would say, uh, and thinking through. And that is something that is harder necessarily for students. But so, yes, I mean, I wish there would be a textbook that forced people to do that. But I think a lot of it is also necessarily something that happens in the course of the pedagogic exercise. Um, the other question on what was the second one? I mean, I see there's a question on MOOCs, but you um, that uh, the, uh, the question is about wasn't isn't the idea of mainstream economics about making the models assumptions? Yeah, just... sure, right. You know, I think you have to remember that ultimately this is all exactly as David said. This is all about power, right? Mainstream economics has is ultimately has been in the service of power. And it's also why they're so determined to extend the power within the discipline and to kind of universalize it and, and not have these little pockets of critical voices or dissenting opinions or, or, or perspectives. So similarly, the reason that a lot of these things are presented the way they are is because not necessarily even that the people writing the books are, you know, malafide, but just that it's the way in which the whole the whole body of knowledge is sought to be presented, which is to indicate or somehow suggest that it is this inevitable known science, when in fact it's hugely dependent on particular assumptions. And those assumptions are usually derived, uh, used in ways that push particular positions that benefit certain groups in the economy. So it's all about power, I mean, simply put. And the question then is, how do you fight that power? I notice we're running out of time. So if I, I'm going to just put in what I want, wanted to say as a concluding point so that you know we don't have uh, later on any rush about it, which is that you know, this thing about confronting power, it's not only that you uh, point out the critiques and so on, but that you have to be very careful and basic in how you explain things to anyone. So I have a rule for my, well, it began as a rule for my research students. And I now make it a rule for all my students, which is that whatever it is you say, whatever is your, your response has to be something that your grandmother will understand. On the basis that your grandmother is an intelligent woman who is not necessarily educated along the same way you are and doesn't know the lingo. So you have to be ex able to explain that concept, that argument, that theory, whatever it is to your grandmother. And I find that that is a terrific way of getting people to say, oh my God, I didn't really understand it because I'm not able to explain it properly. But thank anyway, you. Very I, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I think that's, that's important because when we're going to take economics out to the wider world, that's what we have to carry, that it has to be out there to be understood. Thank you very much for that very interesting final insight. And, um, you know, on that note, I'll also go to uh, Professor Ruccio for his final insight. And with that also fielding uh, one question that's about what do you do when now the teaching environment has become basically, or rather the academic environment has become that of a business. And it also reminds me of this, uh, you know, uh, classic article, The Death of a University by Terry Eagleton. And we are in this neoliberal phase of academic and we see all these performance indicators and uh, which we are all subject to. So how do you in fact think about teaching in that respect and any final reflections from your insights on teaching? Jati, that's a great suggestion. The only problem was my grandmother didn't speak English. 
Um, and I wasn't fluent in Italian. So, so that would have been a little bit difficult for me. Uh, but I, but I still appreciate the, the, the thought behind it. Um, lots of different things here as for textbooks, um, write them. The, the more there are out there, the more we have to choose from. Um, and, and that's fine. Um, I always worry about those textbooks. Our, our mutual friend, Ario Klammer, uh, wrote such a textbook. Um, and, and that's nice. It's an alternative to the way they teach mainstream economics, except I'm not included in that textbook. That is, Marx and economics is not included in there. So I'm not going to use Ario's textbook. Um, um, in fact, I'm writing one right now. I'm writing a, a, a book on Marx and economics, which is a critique of mainstream economics and is set up that way. Um, both of classical political economy and of contemporary economics. As far as the assumptions, um, sure, you know, mainstream economists, all those fancy uh, high modernist mainstream e economists are pushing the theory and, and trying to relax the assumptions and generalize. They work on the assumptions all the time, but they don't teach them. So our students, whether they be undergraduate students or graduate students, don't know the assumptions. Our job is to expose those assumptions. That's, that's part of the politics of teaching political economy. And then to show them that there are alternative assumptions that lead to quite different theories. So we have to be doing that all the time. Parting thought, it, yes, we live in the new corporate university. Um, we, we live and we work and we struggle with this new corporate university and, and yet we still teach. We still have the classroom. They have not taken the classroom away from us. And we have to do whatever we can inside as well as outside that classroom. So, yeah, let's not use it as an excuse. Um, it's hard. Um, it's a, it's a d difficult time to be teaching. I don't wish it upon anyone, but we need teachers. Um, ideas are dangerous. We produce those ideas in and around the classroom, and we have to continue to do so. My parting example, graduating senior, taking my, my political economy course, walks up to me halfway through the semester and he is really angry and he's angry because he's a graduating senior with a major in economics and he'd never heard about any of these theories of political economy. He thought he was getting a major in economics and he realized at that moment that he got a major in one small slice of economics. He hadn't heard about any of these others and, and, and he was angry. He wasn't angry at me. Uh, he was quite, quite thankful that he finally found a course in which he was able to begin, begin to at least learn about those things. And, and, that's, and that's our job. Thanks for ending on that very, I would say, overwhelming and stimulating and optimistic note, because it's also a time where I can see that this is, there was a Twitter trend which talked about your parentage and your grandparentage in terms of your PhD dissertations and stuff, like your supervisors and your supervisor's supervisor. So the people here are basically the grandparentage of my mentors and uh, my supervisors. So it's like a generation that's passing on a wisdom to all of us who are just entering into academia. And I couldn't think of a better session to kind of uh, enrich that initiation into academia. Thank you very much. So and I want to, you know, can I quickly, very quickly respond to one of the questions in there about yes. how India you know, it's true in India, it's not just a corporate university. It's now, I mean, there are all kinds of limitations on teachers. And the public universities are possibly even worse now because they are putting various other kinds of. So what do young people do? And so I would say all, all of you young people from India who are listening, take whatever job you get. Don't worry about it. Do whatever you can and swim around the big fish for now. Even this shall change. So don't worry you're going to be fine so long as you like the farmers you just keep at it you don't give up you keep doing what you want to do and you chip away at it it will eventually work out thank you that's that's a very optimistic note and especially at a time when we're talking about climate change and what's not and so many such dismal science economics is a dismal science coming to us it's basically these thoughts that are basically you know to uh, going to keep us uh, pushing forward and probably bit by bit economics will indeed make progress. So 
Thank you very much. On that note, uh, heartful thank you for this conversation. It was definitely one of the most stimulating conversations I've had in the longest time. And I hope through this uh, INET education project and otherwise we can in fact take these conversations forward and make it a more regular way to engage in teaching in academia, which is increasingly becoming like a secondary, um, you know, taking a backseat in this uh, academia. Thank you very much for this. Thanks, Ruby. Thanks so much. Very good. Yeah, thanks.